Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, I'm, I'm so excited to see um, quite a few people here in the room, and I understand quite a few people on Zoom. So this is the second time we're trying the hybrid um, annual autism public health lecture, and I think so far it's going more smoothly, so that's good. Um, I would like to start with just a, a couple words of welcome to, to kick off this year's lecture. Um, I'm Diana Robbins, the director of the AJ Drexel Autism Institute here at Drexel University. So as some of you already know, the Autism Institute was the first autism research center in the U.S. to focus on the public health science of autism. And we are really excited to um, look at how our four research programs address questions about quality of life for autistic individuals across the life course. So we have a modifiable factors program that is very interested in epi and environmental factors that both increase or decrease um, specific outcomes, whether they be specific aspects of quality of life or health outcomes. We have an early detection and intervention program that focuses on identifying children very young so that they are pointed in the direction of the interventions that are most helpful for them and their families. Um, we have a life course outcomes program that specifically asks questions about quality of life around um, particular uh, time points that are um, more vulnerable for autistic individuals, such as the transition to adulthood. And then we have the policy analytics and community center that asks questions on both local levels through projects like the Philadelphia Autism Project and the Pennsylvania Wide Assert Project, and also on national levels using uh, Medicaid and other national databases. So um, that kind of gives you the, the general sense of who we are and what we do. And um, this year, we actually just celebrated our 10-year anniversary um, from, from the formation of the Autism Institute. And so um, this is a party from our celebration. And the, the fact that we've done so many things in 10 years is really, really exciting. Um, I'd like to take just a moment while I have everyone's attention to just say a few words about a new project that we're really excited about. Um, this fall, we started a new project called Phases, Public Health and Autism Science, Advancing Equitable Strategies Across the Life Course, or Phases. This is an NIH-funded Autism Center of Excellence. Mm -hmm. And what we are doing is we are drawing together all of our interests and expertise around the public health approach to autism research to ask questions that really all center on a premise that the inequities that lead to adverse health outcomes in autism are modifiable. So we have a set of three projects and supported by three cores that bring together common um, approaches using interdisciplinary science, um, deep stakeholder engagement. Um, we focus on underrepresented, minoritized, and economically disadvantaged groups across our projects. And we tackle research questions at three key points in the life course, toddlers, adolescents, and young adults, and older adults. And we're, we're very excited to be launching this project, and um, we hope to have results for you in, in um, the near future, but we're just now getting started. Um, but this is just one of the many projects that the folks at the Autism Institute are committed to and invested in. One of our longstanding, for all 10 years of our existence, um, activities is our annual Autism Public Health Lecture. And so what we do is we rotate through the different research programs to um, think of a speaker or a topic um, that they would like to highlight for this year's lecture. And we welcome not only the scientists in our community, but all of the stakeholders and community voices that we partner with and engage with and talk with um, to attend this lecture. So it's really designed for a broad audience. And for, um, for this year's lecture, I'm going to um, introduce my colleague, Dr. Diana Schendel, who will be introducing our speaker. So thank you very much. Thank you. So it's a, a great pleasure of mine to introduce my esteemed colleague, Chris Latacosta, as our presenter at the 10th Annual Autism Public Health Lecture. Chris began her career with training in cellular and molecular genomics and epigenetics. Somehow advancing. Oops, dear. My paper. I think you bumped it. I bumped it. Sorry. That's okay. Um, 
Yeah, so she she got her training in cellular and molecular genomics and epigenomics, as well as in genetic epidemiology. And her research has been primarily in the fields of genetic and epigenetic epidemiology, but with a particular focus on autism and other neuropsychiatric conditions. Her goals in her research are to further our understanding of the origins of neurodiversity, as well as health conditions experienced by autistic people to inform the means to improve outcomes. And to achieve these goals, she works very hard. She is a longstanding partner in many well-known multi-site research efforts, such as CDC's Study to Explore Early Development, the Boston Birth Cohort, the Early Autism Risk Longitudinal Investigation, and the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes Project. She's also a partner in many international consortia, such as the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, the Pregnancy and Childhood Epigenetics Consortium, and the Lundbeck Foundation Initiative for Integrative Psychiatric Research. Additionally, in the autism arena, she is principal investigator of an NIH Autism Center of Excellence network called Combining Advances in Genomics and Environmental Science to Accelerate Actionable Research and Practice in ASD. She's also a PI, a principal investigator in other NIH projects, such as the autism-specific patterns of DNA methylation from birth to age five, and trimester-specific variation in air quality and risk for neurodevelopmental disorders and natural experiment, which is being carried out in China. Together, we are also collaborating in an NIH-funded study called Air Pollution, Risk for Autism and ADHD, Cross-Disorder Insights, and Genetic Liability and her professional titles speak to her research expertise. She is Associate Professor and Director of Genetics in the Department of Epidemiology and with a mental health joint appointment at Johns Hopkins University. She's also Vice Director of the Wendy Clagg Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities, also at Johns Hopkins. And she's the Associate Director for Epigenomics in the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes Program Data Analysis Center. I have worked with Chris for many years and highly value our collaborations, and not only because of our shared research interests, but because of her leadership, her skill as a scientist, and as a dedicated mentor for emerging new investigators. But perhaps most importantly for us today, Chris can speak both to genetics research issues on the one hand, as well as to epidemiology and public health research issues on the other. And she will be sharing some of her knowledge in her lecture today called Improving Autism Public Health, through the use of a biosciences toolkit. Okay, right, well, thank you, Diana. Diana, it's, uh, let me make sure this is working here. Great, okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. And I think it's been really wonderful to be able to be here in person and really meet so many of you. And um, I think have time together to really engage and talk more about the research that matters to all of us and the people um, that we hope to serve. So I look forward to more after um, this lecture as well. So I wanted to start um, with my disclosures and then also um, acknowledging a large team that I work with. And this is just a small snippet of folks that I collaborate with on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis, particularly for some of the um, data and the studies that I'm gonna share today. In this lecture, you know, there's a lot of um, use of and, and discussion around the use of first person language versus versus person first language. Um, and we respect individuals that choose to identify uh, as identify first um, language. Um, in this lecture, though, I'm going to focus on using person first, just because I'm talking about populations of people um, and don't want to make assumptions about how people want to identify um, themselves. So I wanted to uh, recognize that up front, as well as the term risk. Um, I think colloquially, 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 we often use that um, in a way that has a negative connotation, right? And as a trained epidemiologist, I tend to think of risk in the way we use it more as a measure of comparison, comparing two groups often. Um, and when we say risk, sometimes what we mean, for example, is that um, one group has a higher risk or probability of being tall or maybe having a favorable outcome compared to another group. Um, and so I'm gonna work hard today and try not to use risk colloquially or at all, but I'm still a person, I make mistakes, I'm still learning and trying to get around that language. So please bear with me um, if that comes through. Okay. And then finally, I wanted to really jump into, I think, the meat of our um, lecture and discussions today, 
and thinking about our research goals. Um, and our research goals in autism public health really need to be informed by our stakeholders, right? The sort of um, mantra, nothing for or, or um, nothing for or about us without us, I think is really critical. And in doing that, I'm gonna share um, some of, I think today, hopefully the research goals we have that has been informed by some of our stakeholders. And I'm hoping we can sort of use this today as a platform to really start a conversation, right? About what those needs are and how maybe some of what I'm sharing today, we could think about using um, and the pros and cons maybe to using those to answer some of these questions. And so I think it's no surprise to all of you that autism is really a spectrum that has many often co-occurring um, symptoms and conditions and dimensions um, and is quite heterogeneous. And I think when I think about stakeholders, the one thing that stands out to me is, well, you know, it's not sort of one stakeholder, right? If it's really a spectrum and heterogeneity, we have lots of different individuals with very different, perhaps even needs, right? And so I think we need to recognize it's not one particular stakeholder group um, or another, but it's really all of these we need to think about. So instead of a um, autistic people or autistic adults with autism we, we serve, it's really all of these, those and parents of children um, and many other groups here. Okay, and so as I said, I'm gonna share with you some of our research goals um, at the Wendy Clagg Center and within my group, which has really been informed by a fabulous community advisory board um, that we have built over the past um, about two years now with the help of Michelle Landrum, who is a research associate and um, communication specialist with us. And our group is composed of a diverse set of individuals. So autistic adults, uh, parents of autistic adults with um, differing ranges of severity, parents of children with autism, uh, different stakeholder groups and organizations, nonprofit organizations that work with autistic populations, um, bioethicists, and individuals with expertise in developing community advisory boards. And so we really, again, wanted to capture and include a range of different individuals, all with different um, sort of diverse perspectives to help inform our research goals. And again, I think today, you know, I think it's also an opportunity for us to start the conversation and what I'm going to share um, and talk about, are these the appropriate goals? Are there ways we can do this better or where some of these may need to shift or we need to add to them? Okay, so what are our goals then? So again, these are really informed what I'm gonna to share today by our stakeholders and our board um, and these multiple different views um, that they all have and these needs or their desires. And these really span from sort of birth to adulthood. So I think fits nicely with this group's um, interest too on thinking about autism through the lifespan, not just one particular life stage. And so one of our goals is to treat occurring um, signs and symptoms that may be experienced or perceived by some individuals on the spectrum. A second goal um, is to prevent the challenges or perceived challenges experienced by some associated with autism to prevent future challenges given being on the autism spectrum. We'll, we'll talk more about each of those. And then to predict the onset of some of the above or um, improved prognosis and response to treatment, for example, and to design better public health and care delivery systems. Um, and so, the ways that public health can address these um, stakeholder needs, there are a number of sort of ways it can address them and a number of things we need to do. And the first is really to describe autism in the community, right? We need to understand um, autism in the community. What is the prevalence in the community? What does it look like? And what are the characteristics of individuals with autism? And so this is important for public health because it changes our conversation, right, from a me or a one person to really an us and from my child to our children, right? So it's a more population and inclusive perspective when we understand everyone in the population and in the community. It helps us to have a better understanding, right, of who we are when we can describe and understand the community um, of individuals with autism. It helps to um, inform our planning for autism early intervention detection for treatment and support services. 
And so there's lots of work now going on by the Atom Network, which has been going on for two decades, as I think many or all of you probably know, um, that most recently included 11 states. I was hoping today to be able to share the 2020 estimates with you all, but the um, date for the release of those was pushed back to Thursday at 1 p.m. So stay tuned. Thursday at 1 p.m. the embargo will be lifted and those numbers will be released. Um, and this is work that um, we are ongoing. We just received funding to continue this work for the next four years to, again, describe um, the population characteristics of autism in Maryland specifically. And that's with my co-PI, um, Elise Poss. Okay. Um, in addition, you know, public health research can also address our stakeholder needs by forming a basis, right, for policy and for decision makers on what some rational policy is by using evidence-based data. Okay, so what I'm mostly going to focus on today is not those sort of last two bullets I talked about on how public health can address these stakeholder needs, but it's really going to be on the next three bullet points, right, and how we can use our bio, what I'm calling a um, bioscience toolkit, and I'll tell you more about what our toolkit is next, to inform some of these specific um, goals that we have in our center. And so the first one is when we take a public health perspective to each of these sort of colored goals that we've already outlined, it can help to permit development of new treatment strategies, um, including for co-occurring conditions. It can also provide a possibility for preventing symptoms that are not wanted or desired by avoiding modifiable risk factors. And it can help us to optimize some of the above um, strategies. So thinking more about, you've probably heard a lot about precision medicine. I like to think now about precision public health, right? How can we best utilize the limited resources we have to have the largest, most impactful, um, the largest sort of most effective impact on our community and our populations? Okay, so those are our goals. That's how we think sort of through a public health perspective um, of how we can achieve those goals and why they're important. I wanted to next give you a little bit of background and an introduction to our sort of biologic toolkit for today, recognizing some of you might not um, have much of a background in uh, genetics or molecular molecules. So I wanted to start with DNA. So DNA is really the building block of our cells. And it is composed of four nucleotides. We call A, C's, G's, and T's. You can think of them as letters in the alphabet. Each cell in our body contains about 3 billion of these letters, A, C's, G's, and T's. Those nucleotides and that those 3 billion letters are organized into chromosomes and what we call gene units. And so here we've got sort of our sequence then of our A's, C's, G's, and T's inside of one cell, let's say in the body. Those are then organized into genes. We have about 20 to 25,000 genes inside our cells. And then those genes are further sort of organized and wound up and fit um, and organized into a chromosome, which is a higher 3D structure. And there are differences, what's important for today about this is that there are differences in these gene nucleotides among individuals in our population. So at 99% of all of these 3 billion places in our DNA sequence, we're identical. But about every one in a thousand nucleotides or ACs, Gs, and Ts, we have a difference. And so this is illustrating at this particular place in our sequence, person one has an AA, variant in their DNA, person two has a GA, and person three has a GG, right? So they're differences. And then these differences in those sequences can result in differences in cell functions and then ultimately in outcomes among individuals. So for example, differences in the DNA we know are related to differences in height between individuals in our population. And then we also, with another important concept to think about is these specific genes, while they're the same in every single cell in our body, certain genes are turned off and certain genes are turned on depending on a cell's functions and needs. And so I'm showing an example here of sort of the gene serving as an analogy as water running through a faucet. So you can think about that gene sort of having lots of water coming out or being expressed 
or the gene having very little of the sort of product being expressed. And that differs in different cells. Again, and you can have differences between individuals as well that might be related to differences in these A, C, G, and T sequences in the DNA. And then further, so we layer on top of that, there is another type of biologic material that's called DNA methylation. And that's shown here by the um, red sort of lollipop looking um, figure. And these are a type of um, modification that literally sits and binds on top of the DNA at certain places in the sequence. And that helps to control how much of the gene is turned off or turned off. So it kind of serves as the handle on top of the faucet, right? That's sort of controlling how much of the water comes out of the spigot versus how much it's sort of clamped down here and turned off. So again, really important, both changes in our DNA sequence potentially between individuals, and then also some of these other biologic changes and methylation in particular can control how genes are expressed and then differences in populations of individuals, which can be related then to health outcomes. Okay, so another sort of um, difference between the DNA sequence and epigenetics, something that's important to note, is that essentially every cell in our body has exactly the same DNA sequence, right? The A, C's, G's, and T's are the same, but clearly those cells have really different functions and jobs. And the reason they're different, what makes them different, are these methylation patterns, right? So those are what sort of specify which cell is which cell type. Um, so again, really important in establishing cell function and cell identity um, and the function of cells and sits on top of the DNA sequence. It's also, as you'll see later in the lecture, um, important an important way, methylation, for cells to be able to respond to their environment dynamically without having to have a change to the DNA sequence, right? So you don't have to have a change in the actual sequence itself to modify the cell program and pathways that are occurring. Okay, so like uh, the DNA sequence, methylation patterns can also differ between individuals in our population. So I'm showing here our example again, where we have three people um, with three different kinds of DNA sequence or genetic variants. And then you can see these individuals can also have differences in their methylation patterns at different positions in the genome. And so these are the two types of biologic marks that we're going to be focusing on today. Genetic variants, right, or gene variants in the sequence, and methylation changes or patterns that sit on top of those variants. And so what I'm hoping to do today is give you a um, sort of some insight into how we're thinking these biologic tools might be helpful to answer some of our and address some of the research goals. And so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples for each of those. There are many more. I couldn't possibly fit them into sort of one lecture in one day, um, but I'm hoping to give you a range and sort of a little bit of an idea of where we're coming from and how we're thinking about these. Again, would love to have discussion and feedback on all of your thoughts um, on, on these ideas. So the first is um, we could use this biologic toolkit to help us to understand differences um, in, um, in uh, health outcomes, including co-occurring conditions in autism. And so I'm gonna give you an example of some of the work that we did to try and understand um, gastrointestinal symptoms in individuals with autism. And so a little bit of background here is that, um, again, probably not surprising to many of you, individuals with autism, have a higher frequency of other health um, concerns. And so the one I'm highlighting here in green is just highlighting what we're gonna be focusing on here today, which is gastrointestinal symptoms. So individuals with autism have been reported to have a higher frequency of gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, common symptoms for children with autism um, are listed here. And then this can lead to higher levels of hospitalization and emergency department visits. So it has an impact among individuals with autism. And so there are several possible explanations, right, for why there's this increase in GI symptoms. Previous studies have mainly focused on differences perhaps in eating behaviors, 
or in sensory processing um, differences, immune functioning, and the gut microbiome. But one thing that hadn't been considered to all our knowledge is whether or not genes might be relevant to these gastrointestinal symptoms and more common among individuals with autism, the specific uh, gene variants. And so we actually thought about um, inflammatory bowel disease. So I'm showing here there are under inflammatory bowel disease, there are two specific types of um, conditions, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that fall under that umbrella. And both of those have GI symptoms that are similar to those that have been documented among individuals with autism, including diarrhea, loose stool, abdominal pain on stooling. And about 250 gene variants, so those changes in the DNA sequence we talked about, have previously been discovered by groups and associated with these two conditions. And importantly, IBD has FDA-approved treatments, right, to reduce these GI symptoms in those individuals. And so what we wanted to test and ask was whether or not individuals with autism had more of these particular gene variants than individuals without. And that's important because it could help us to lead us to biology, right, and genetic variants that perhaps could suggest treatments that are already in use for other conditions that then could um, be considered perhaps to address some of these GI conditions for individuals with autism. So that was sort of a little bit of our rationale and thinking there, how we could use understanding genetic variants um, to address this. And so this work was led by a student of mine, Val Morrill, um, in the SEED study. So the SEED study is a relatively large multi-site U.S. autism case control study that enrolled almost 7,000 families um, across six sites in the U.S. At the time they were enrolled, children were between the ages of two to five, and GI symptom data was collected as part of a survey. And genetic data is also available, so those gene variants, for a subset right now of those participants. So it was 562 children with autism and 715 without autism. What we did is we used that data to build what we call a polygenic or polygenetic score. Sometimes for short, you'll hear this called a PGS or a PRS. Um, and what this is, my, I'm sorry, my automation is, is not performing the way I expected. Um, but what it is, is essentially, if you think about each of those single gene variants we talked about, and now we talked about IBD having about 240 of those that we know are associated with gastrointestinal symptoms, we can sum up how many of those individual variants each individual has. And we do that when I'm showing, oops, sorry, here, is what that distribution then across our population of individuals looks like. So on the left-hand side of this curve would be individuals that have fewer of those IBD gene variants. And on the right-hand side would be the, the sort of score for individuals that have a larger number, right? A simple count or more of those IBD genetic variants or gene variants. <clears throat> And so what we then performed, once we had these values for each participant, we then ran regression models, adjusting for a number of covariates, to determine whether or not there were associations between having more of these IBD um, variants and having an autism diagnosis. So here's the hypothesis essentially we're testing with this second step in the regression analysis is, are there shifts? in the number of IBD gene variants that individuals with autism have, which in this illustration we're just calling cases, compared to individuals without autism. So that's the test we're doing. And what we found actually was surprising to us um, that there was no significant shift in the IBD gene scores between children with and without autism. If we look here in our adjusted odds ratios, um, for overall IBD, um, we did not see significant increase odds of having GI symptoms, uh, or sorry, difference in the number of gene variants individuals with autism had compared to those without. And that was also true for the specific, each specific IBD variant as well. So instead of this, 
we actually, oops, we did not find there was a difference. What we found is these were largely overlapping, right? There were no shifts in the number of variants among individuals with or without autism for these IBD genes. And so we then said, okay, but what about specific gastrointestinal symptoms? Are there differences related to specific symptoms among children with ASD? And so we then looked um, and we found that there was a significant association between the ulcerative colitis genetic score and having any GI symptoms in children without ASD only. So again, a little bit surprising to us that um, children, again, young children without autism actually had more, those that had more ulcerative colitis genetic variants had an increase in all GI symptoms, but children with autism didn't. There were no significant differences. And then finally, when we looked at specific symptoms, that same result held, where in the black rectangles, we found significant increase in GI symptoms among individuals that had lower gene variants for IBD, but only in the children without autism. We did not see any elevated risk among children with autism for any of the specific uh, GI symptoms. And so what are the implications of these findings? Well, I think it helps to inform us, right? Although we did not find an association, it still helps inform the suitability, right? Of potential GI treatments and prioritization of those treatments. Um, and the next steps for trying to figure out why um, there is this increase in GI symptoms. And so it suggests that the gene biology related to GI symptoms in young children with autism and without autism differs from, I or with autism differs from IBD. Um, and that it also differs um, from children without ASD, right? So the GI symptoms are different in those two groups. Um, and IBD genes seem to be relevant for those without autism, but not those with autism. And so there's lots of other sort of explanations for why we didn't see this, and there could still be underlying biology that we just missed because we didn't look at it, right? We focused on the IBD genes, but we talked about there are many, many sort of other variants in the genome we could look at. And so we're also considering other variants and other biology um, and whether those might be increased among individuals with GI conditions and or GI symptoms and autism. Um, it could also be uh, gene variants related, for example, to food digestion or absorption, right? We didn't necessarily look at those. We also didn't look at whether there are um, gene variants that might be related to having specific sensory um, or restrictive um, food aversions, right? Or sensory um, differences. And so those also could be driving, right? Some of those behaviors that ultimately could lead to GI symptoms. And then finally, it could also be non-genetic um, and or depend on an environmental context or condition. It could be due to sort of the gut microbes, right? And homeostasis there. And again, sort of behavioral or eating behaviors. <clears throat> okay, so that was sort of, again, sort of a glimpse of some of the work we're doing and the questions we're thinking about addressing with a focus on GI conditions um, and symptoms, but you could think about other um, health concerns um, and future sort of health um, outcomes among children or among individuals with autism to think about whether gene variants can help us to identify biology that could be targeted to help um, reduce some of those symptoms they experience. Okay, so the second um, point that I wanted to highlight on how we could use potentially biologic tools to achieve a goal would be how can we use these biologic tools um, to prevent to um, to prevent symptoms by avoiding modifiable factors? And here I'm going to focus on particularly when what I call genetic context matters. So it's when there's an environmental or modifiable factor um, that we may want to we learn could be avoided um, based on some underlying genetic sort of variants. So the example here I'm going to give is actually outside of autism. It is an example through um, phenoketal urea, which is called PKU for short. Um, many of you may be familiar with this, but I think this gives you the idea of how we might be able to or how studying genetic variants um, could help us to identify modifiable factors um, to prevent certain um, symptoms experienced by 
individuals with autism. So a little bit of background on PKU. After birth, um, newborns typically don't have any symptoms of this condition. However, without treatment, they'll develop signs within a few months. And the signs of PKU include severe intellectual disability, seizures, psychiatric conditions, eczema, um, small head size, size, musty odor, and developmental delay. And so here's how studying genetics actually revealed the biologic mechanism behind PKU. What they found is that typically um, when you eat foods, those are often high in protein. In proteins, proteins are high in phenylalanine. And then phenylalanine in the body usually gets broken down by a gene called PAH into tyrosine. This is then cleared out of the body and it's, it's um, not problematic. However, um, when individuals ingest proteins that contain phenylalanine and they have a um, change in their PAH gene, so one of these gene variants, it can cause them to not be able to break down that phenylalanine, and then they have a buildup of phenylalanine, which actually this buildup is toxic and damages the nerve system. And so despite PK, um, PKU being a, considered a genetic disease, right? It by definition is called a genetic disease, but I think this is really clear evidence where we can actually prevent PKU and those symptoms by actually modifying the environment, right? We don't have to change the DNA sequence because we learned about the biology through the DNA sequence. We've already learned now a mechanism in a way then to prevent exposure to proteins that are high in phenylalanine to prevent those symptoms. So individuals with this particular gene variant can follow a specific low protein, low phenylalanine diet to prevent those symptoms. And so what's now done, sort of the public health application of that is there's now universal population screening for this PKU in newborns. So it occurs typically in about one to every 10 to 15,000 newborns. And some of you, if you've ever um, given birth, you may remember um, a few days later having um, heel sticks and blood collected on a blood spot card. Um, those are sent away to actually test for an increase in phenylalanine due to this sort of gene variant um, that that newborn may have. And if they have that, then the intervention is modify the diet, right? So that they don't have the symptoms as a downstream result. So again, this is an example, I think, of a public health approach um, to enable early intervention and prevention of symptoms, but where we had to study and understand the genes, right? To really understand that mechanism and how it worked and identify what specific factor we had to modify to prevent those symptoms. And so we're just beginning to learn about genetic differences among neurodiverse individuals and those on the spectrum and their potential interplay with the environment, right? And so there are a number of efforts going on to detect what we call rare gene variants. So those that are just not very common in the human population, there are efforts by the Psych Genetic Consortia that are ongoing to try and understand gene variation differences that are commonly occurring in our population and more commonly in individuals on the spectrum. And then we also have, um, as Dr. Schendel mentioned, a new um, GEARS Autism Center um, uh, project that we're really excited about to think about how both genes and environment um, are important in neurodiversity uh, and autism and how we can leverage genetics to help identify modifiable environments um, and contexts to be able to improve their life course outcomes. Okay, so the second example, I wanted to give you another example in this category of how we can use biologic and these omics tools to help identify modifiable factors. And so the example I'm going to give here is on DNA methylation signatures. So remember, these are the little sort of chemical modifications. I think of them as the sprinkles on top of the ice cream cone you have, um, where um, they control gene expression um, and turn genes on and off. And so DNA methylation, this type of mark, 
uh, for the past, I would say even five years has just exploded the field and really understanding that they are susceptible to environmental exposures. This table's a little bit outdated now, um, but what I love about it is that it shows you that a range of different types of exposures, so everything ranging from chemical toxicants to lifestyle and demographic types of environments have all been associated with changes in these methylation patterns in individuals in the population, and that the evidence for their changes comes not just from observational epidemiology studies, but also from experimental models and lab toxicology studies. And so I'm going to walk you through a story now um, that really demonstrates, I think, um, a proof of principle uh, sort of uh, exposure um, and the, a proof of principle for this idea that we can use methylation signatures, again, as a marker of environmental exposures to help identify modifiable factors. And so this is... Um, evidence that we and many others now have contributed to over the years, where there are 26, and now there are even more, over a thousand places in the genome in that ACGT sequence, where the methylation marks show a significant association with maternal smoking during pregnancy. Now, these methylation patterns we're measuring in child samples. And in the plot on the bottom over here, we're measuring methylation at those 26 places in cord blood at birth. And you can see each one of these bar charts is the methylation, you can think of it as the methylation pattern um, between individuals that had exposure and those that didn't have exposure across each of the 26 positions we measured. So you can see there's sort of a pattern there, right, of these marks related to prenatal exposure. We looked then in blood in five-year-olds. So the blood was collected at age five. We looked at the methylation patterns at these 26 positions. And we were shocked to see actually the pattern of the changes was almost identical to the other individual study, uh, uh, the other independent study um, and that had measured it at birth. So this suggests, and actually there's lots of lines of evidence now showing that these methylation changes related to prenatal exposure to smoking actually can be detected into adults that are 50 years old, mm -hmm. that they sort of persist. Mm -hmm. And so we think of that as, you know, it can be a marker, a biologic marker of past modifiable exposures. And there are also other sort of current exposures it can measure as well in current states. Here's an example. We then sort of took it one step further and said, okay, but can you actually predict, right, with high accuracy, if you were just to use these methylation marks, can you actually predict their past exposure? And on the, the left-hand side, I'm showing you the data from seed from our um, five-year-old participants where with 87% accuracy, we, we were able to predict their prenatal um, exposure. Um, it was not true. You could not detect, um, you could not use the methylation patterns at these 26 sites to accurately predict other exposures they had during pregnancy. So they appeared also to be specific to smoking. And then this is evidence from another group, the ALSPAC group in the UK, where they had blood collected from individuals that were between 30 and 53 years of age and again, they were able to predict past exposure, prenatal exposure to smoking. And what was striking about this paper is it was independent of their own personal smoking history, sort of postnatal and as adults. So they seem to be different signatures, personal adult smoking versus prenatal um, smoking exposure. Um, okay, and then since then, you know, that was really, again, the proof of principle work um, and the most studied marks or most studied exposure so far is smoking. But over the last few years, again, the field is really just exploding and understanding many other methylation signatures or changes um, for exposures, both current and historic, continue to emerge. And so it's a way for us to capture modifiable environmental factors kind of in a different way than we traditionally would, right, through surveys or other kinds of biospecimen collection and toxicant measures. So it's using this biospecimen toolkit, right, to capture modifiable risk factors. Okay. So what are the implications of these results? So again, I think the implications of this work is that there's potential to improve our ability to identify modifiable environments that might impact autism symptoms and other conditions experienced by those individuals. 
And it, okay, yeah, there we go. And it could also help us to monitor them, right? If we think about these as it truly as a biomarker of an exposure or a modifiable factor, we often want to then intervene, right, and reduce that modifiable factor, let's say. We could monitor this, this mark before and after, right, an intervention as sort of a biologic marker of how effective, potentially, that intervention is. Another sort of marker of that. Another implication um, from this line of evidence is that it also might be a better biomarker of cumulative exposures or multiple exposures um, or your sort of biologic response to an exposure, right? So we typically, I think, for modifiable factors, many of us or many exposures will think of measuring, I call them external. Here's where the, the lack of environmental health and epi comes out for me, but we, I think about them as sort of external measures of are you smoking and how many pack years are you smoking, right? Versus how's your body responding to that, right? Each individual might have a really different biologic response to, to the same number of cigarettes, let's say, smoked. And so we think these bio tools or these methylation patterns, actually we have evidence to support, they may be a better indicator of inter-individual differences in response to sort of these external exposures. So I think of it as kind of an internal dosimeter, if you will, of an exposure. Okay. And so, so I talked about, right, it can provide a biomarker. So here where we think of it as, um, you know, we're not interested or where it doesn't necessarily, it's not on the causal pathway, these changes to a health outcome. But if it's a uh, signature of an exposure, we could use that as a complementary or alternative way to measure an exposure and ask questions about how modifiable factors and exposures influence health outcomes. And we can think about that across, again, the lifespan. Often in public health and epidemiology, right, when we're recruiting participants and designing studies, we might be recruiting over here in childhood or adolescence or adulthood. And so if we want to use that data to ask questions about modifiable factors that may have occurred in other, other life stage windows, if we haven't biosampled them and we want to measure a chemical toxicant, often they have short half-lives, and so we may have missed the window. So these, again, provide a potential opportunity to measure them later in life and ask questions or get uh, ascertain earlier environmental exposure um, measures. Okay, so that wraps up the sort of second idea or theme in our research goals is how can we use, again, the toolkit, so genetic variants, and how can we use methylation kinds of patterns and changes to help to identify modifiable factors. And then the final point I wanted to touch upon is um, how we can optimize some of the above strategies, right? So how we can optimize prevention, treatment, identification of these factors um, in more efficient ways. So build better and more precise public health systems. All right, and I'm gonna walk you through um, a few examples here. Uh, again, not in autism. I think these are meant to be a little bit proactive and show you where other fields are and how they're being used. Um, and I think it, you know, we're not quite there yet in autism. And I think we have to have lots of, op of discussion, right, about whether we should even do this in autism and whether it makes sense. So this is, again, to set us up, I think, for talking about some of these as well later today. So improved outcome prediction is one possibility through methylation and these gene variant methods or measures. And so here's where we have, wait, sorry, I need to walk. Here's where we have our, um, we have our biologic toolkit that we talked about. So gene variants and methylation patterns are variants. And those variants and that data could be used to actually predict treatment, efficacy, and safety profiles. So we call that pharmacogenetics. They could be used to help aid diagnoses or prognoses of health outcomes later, or susceptibility to certain types of conditions, even let's say later in life. And so there are lots of other um, lots of other fields where these are in use today. And so here's an example of how gene tools are used for predictive purposes in breast cancer management. And so here you can see the gene tools. We'll start with 
um, there are genetic sort of tests that can be used to determine susceptibility, right, to let's say breast cancer. There are also tools to help predict likelihood of recurrence of a particular condition or symptom here being recurrence of cancer. And then there are also um, genomic and methylation tools that can also help to inform treatment. So now we're over here, um, sort of on the, the spectrum where we can think about how to use those to inform and to optimize the most effective treatments um, for certain individuals or certain populations with particular types of genetic variants, let's say, or subtypes or methylation patterns. <clears throat> Here's, they're also used um, for treatment efficacy and safety. So again, more examples of other fields um, that are using these omics tools. This is an example for um, a gene variant and a gene called IL-28B, where it can predict the likelihood of response to an interferon therapy for HCV viral infections. They are used to enhance drug safety profiles. You can test for gene variants that predict whether you're hypersensitive to certain drugs, and that can inform how clinicians, um, which drugs they will give you and whether you are sensitive to certain drugs. And then finally, it can help with optimizing the dose for certain, let's say, um, drugs or medications. So here's an example of for warfarin, um, you can actually use gene variants um, to predict and determine what the optimal dose is of a particular treatment so that they have an optimal, again, outcome, which differs based on their genetic variation. So that's a little bit more on the sort of prediction side and thinking about, I would say, um, precision medicine. I wanted to give you a flavor, though, of how we might think about using this for public health precision, right, or precision public health. And so the example I'm going to give you is for air pollution and its effects on um, autism spectrum outcomes. And the idea here is that modifiable exposure impacts on the health outcomes, so the impact of air pollution on autism spectrum outcomes could differ by underlying genetic context, right, or certain gene variants in um, the DNA sequence. And if we could identify subgroups um, that are particularly then susceptible, let's say, to these modifiable factors, we could then tailor our public health intervention um, Great. So this is work from my colleague Heather Volk um, from years ago showing that the effect of prenatal exposure to air, air pollution on autism outcomes differs by gene variants in this gene called MET. And what I want you to focus on here is what's in red, that this group of participants or individuals that had this CC gene variant, right? We talked about how there can be three different variants, let's say, at this one place in the genome. Individuals that had this type of gene variant and that had the highest exposure to nitrogen dioxide had 3.6 fold increased odds of having autism diagnosis compared to individuals that had um, a low exposure and a GG genotype. Right. What's also really important to note here or see here is that individuals that had this gene variant, right, they have the same gene variant as these individuals, but when they had lower exposure, they weren't at increased odds of autism, right? And so it really suggests that you have to have both a CC gene variant and the exposure, the highest exposure, to increase that odds or probability of having an autism diagnosis. So how does that help us with precision, precision public health? Well, let's think about it. If we now know that individuals with this particular variant are at the highest risk, right, we could then um, specifically focus on putting, let's say, HEPA filters in the homes of individuals with those variants, right, to then reduce their NO2 exposure levels so that they're now in this group. Right, so we could then reduce, or we could we could modify an environmental factor to reduce their risk, even though they have the same sort of genetic variant, right, as these individuals here that have the highest risk with highest exposure. So again, it can really help us, I think, to optimize our systems and think about 
how can we best use, right, the limited resources we have, often for public health, to have sort of the biggest, if you will, um, result or the most impactful result among the people, right, at the highest risk. Okay, so that was the last sort of example I wanted to give you to get us thinking about how we might be able to use um, the, these bio sort of science toolkits and genetics and methylation to inform public health autism and address some of these research goals. And so there are certainly lots of challenges and additional considerations. You know, does this biologic toolkit solve everything? No, definitely not, right? We also need to consider other avenues of research and practice in ASD to really provide meaningful, actionable approaches. So I think it complements a lot of other work that's going on. It is not going to um, replace any of that work. And then I think, again, you know, as we've sort of talked about earlier, it's really critical when we think about what we're doing and how it applies that we involve stakeholders. It's important to have that two-way street, right, where we're sharing with them information we're learning and where they're sharing with us what their goals are and how what we're doing really impacts them and their communities. And then finally, you know, I mentioned our CAB has bioethicists or our, our CAB board, our community advisory board has a bioethicist. I do think, you know, the fields are at this sort of turning point where we really need to think carefully um, about our research goals um, informed by stakeholders, about potential benefits and harms of using these omics toolkits, and also about, you know, um, potential harms even of not including neurodiverse individuals and not allowing them opportunities to benefit from application of some of these toolkits. So lots we need to think about and consider in balance, but I also wanted to point that out. And then finally, I think there's a lot of future opportunities, right? We're just beginning to understand these biologic changes relevant to the autism spectrum and neurodiversity. We need to be more inclusive of diverse groups, right? To really fully realize the potential of these tools um, where we consider appropriately the stakeholder needs and concerns. So we need to include neurodiverse groups. We need to include economically, racially, and ethnically diverse populations, gender diverse, and many others. So again, I hope this is meant to provide a slice of how we're thinking about using these um, genetic and methylation kinds of bio toolkits to benefit individuals um, on the autism spectrum. But certainly I think there's lots more discussion needed here as well as in the community more broadly, which I think is highlighted. Many of you, if not all of you, I'm sure saw this recent article in Spectrum News on us sort of being at the crossroads. And so I think Many are scared of being at these crossroads. Um, I think it's really an opportunity for us to start to have these discussions um, amongst each other and all of our stakeholders and hear from all of them, right? And really recognize and hear all of their concerns and be inclusive. Again, it's not one or the other. It's, um, you know, it's parents and neurodiverse um, groups and all of the others as well. Okay. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you for your attention. And really, I think listening to this perspective um, and our goals, and I'm happy to take questions and I think open the dialogue to have a discussion and hear all of your perspectives on this and anything else. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris, that was amazing, yeah. fantastic. In the room first, anyone here in the room? I know we're gonna take questions uh, from people that are participating via the webinar, but here in the room, would anyone like to start us off with a question? Bruce. So this, uh, as a non-scientist, this is a question to help me understand the difference between gene expression and methylation. So mm -hmm. if I understand that we are all born with the genes that we're born with, mm -hmm. and you explained how that can vary um, person to person, mm -hmm. are we each born with a specific methylation pattern as well, or does that is that environmentally influenced? Great, both. So we are born with a pattern. Um, those patterns are literally what defines a cell as a cell type. Um, that being said, I think some of those are going to be stable and they aren't going to change over, over our lifetime and they are not going to change with exposures. Other specific places do seem to change over time and be influenced by environments. Yep. And I will say, sort of, I'll add to that is that 
you know, we think the prenatal window in particular is a really important window because it turns out those methylation patterns have to be completely erased and reestablished during development, organismal development, right? And so that's a place where they're particularly susceptible to having the patterns laid down in a certain way. Christine. Um, well, first, really great talk, Chris, um, and a great job describing what is and, and clarifying what is a, a challenging and complex topic. Um, I was really interested in the seed GI results, and, mm -hmm. and in fact, that it when you showed those, I'm like, oh, it's it's environmental and it, it's probably dietary. Um, so I was curious, kind of what next steps are there, and then also mm -hmm. for things like food sensory issues, which could also have genetic yep. and or environment, like how you tease apart, yep. figuring that out. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think the first thing is we're starting to build evidence just to look at the genome as a whole and heritability. I know you're probably familiar with heritability, but is there any evidence that any genes contribute to differences in GI symptoms. And so we really need more samples to be able to accurately compute those measures. So that's what we're doing is we're trying to get larger samples where we can see, is there any evidence to support that any gene variants contribute? If there is, then I think it suggests our next steps are, we're just not looking at the right ones, right? We were looking at a very specific set. We need to, I think, broaden that to include others. Those others, as you pointed out, might include things that are kind of upstream, right, of downstream nutrition or other kinds of behavioral sort of differences. So it could be part of the sort of cause, if you will, in that way. But that's very different and how right it still informs how you might intervene right you would be in, in my mind if it's upstream of the behavior of the genetics um it's probably more behavioral intervention you would target right if it's really sort of a biology not related to that and it's a particular pathway or metabolic sort of system that could be targeted with a modifiable sort of factor change that's a really different thing does that help Great help. Thank you so much. Um, so I had a few questions. I was very interested in the results that you presented about the smoking and the methylation pattern. Mm -hmm. And what I'm curious with that um, is, are there certain thresholds or levels of exposure that are needed to mm -hmm. induce those types of methylation patterns? And then do those levels of exposure um, parallel and those thresholds then parallel to changes in outcomes that you would see? And mm -hmm. uh, because it would be very interesting yeah. to be able to look at methylation patterns and say like what level were you exposed to or what types of mm -hmm. things you were exposed to but then yeah. are those um do those parallel the same types of effects that we would expect from getting that same kind of dose response relationship um, yeah. By looking at exposure? yeah good question so we like the sort of genetic scores where you can sum up and aggregate your variants across all the places you looked. We can do that for methylation, and we're doing that now too. So those 26 sites, we can kind of sum up into one single value that represents your pattern across those 26 sites. And in fact, when we do that, um, there are, for smoking anyway, strong dose response relationships. So you see a clear sort of pattern with if you had pack years measured, right, and the sort of um, methylation score or value for that. I think, again, it's really an emerging field. And so, um, you know, I think most of us would say, well, it's really not that hard to collect smoking, right? And it's probably pretty reliable um, in many situations, but for lots of other kinds of exposures, right, or factors, that's not the case. And so that's where I think a lot of work's being done now for other chemical toxicants um, and other factors to see whether these dose responses occurs, occur. And then also there's a lot of work, um, there's some great work by Erin Dunn on um, socio-environmental stressors um, and, you know, child adversity and whether there are specific windows, right, where um, they influence the methylation patterns, right? So cumulative versus recent exposures versus very specific sort of windows of life and life stages that influence those. And she has some provocative re results on that as well for those types of exposures. So I think we're just, again, beginning to get started to understand this um, and see where we can take it. Mm -hmm. Chris, I think next to uh, get someone that is online. Great. 
Um, the question is, what support exists for those with ASD who identify as non-binary or LGBTQIA? What gene studies exist that support a higher connection to this community or not? Yeah, I think it's a great point. And I think there are just not enough studies out there. We need more representation. Yeah, I don't know of any um, that specifically consider that, you know, those groups. And another one, mm -hmm. um, have any studies been done on cord blood from previous pregnancies with no diagnosis used for studies in an ASD child? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that again? <laughs> have any studies been done on cord blood mm -hmm. from previous pregnancies with no diagnosis used for studies in ASD? Maybe when a subsequent child then has that it? autism and you go back and look at the cord blood from the prior pregnancies. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if, if you've, so often cord blood is saved or banked and frozen. So you can go back and you can measure that, the methylation later. Is that the question? I'm not sure, maybe they can expand on it. Yes, I think that's that's what most of the studies are doing that. So it's actually using frozen cord blood from even decades ago. And in fact, um, you know, one of some studies are even going back, I think even in iPsych, you can go back and use dry blood spot cards, right, from decades ago to actually measure gene variants and also methylation patterns now from um, bank specimens. So some studies have done that. We might also be referring to the multi-generational Multi-generational, okay. Yeah, so I will say a word on that. So, you know, one of the, so for methylation patterns, right, they are reversible, some of them. They are also what we call heritable. So people, when we use the term heritable there, it's really confusing because we mean mitotically heritable. So when a cell divides, that's how it remembers what kind of cell it is. It remembers its methylation patterns. There's a biologic mechanism for that. It doesn't mean that methylation is actually inherited from the parents, right? That, that is a whole um, huge sort of debate in the field of epigenetics that has gone on for decades now and whether that actually occurs. And there are lots of reasons why it's really hard to study hard to really determine, but we don't have, I would say, strong evidence that that occurs outside of, yeah, other genetic or direct environmental exposure measures. Mm -hmm. Two totally unrelated ones. <laughs> so the, the first one, you know, in thinking about your, um, some of your suggestions about how we want to be thoughtful about what we mm -hmm. do want to pursue in autism and what we don't. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if people are looking at these DNA methylation patterns associated with some of the adverse outcomes, not associated with autism itself. Mm -hmm. Because I think in something like breast cancer, there's no <laughs> like happy part or a healthy or, or, or positive part yep. of having breast cancer. Whereas in autism, mm -hmm. We're thinking about a neurodevelopmental condition where there are a lot of strengths and assets yeah. and also a lot of areas of challenge and how people's strengths yeah. versus challenges balances out really is part of that variability yeah. in the spectrum. So, you know, thinking about, I'm part of the early detection and intervention team, mm -hmm. so thinking about um, are there methylation patterns that relate to whether children are able to mm -hmm. um, communicate in a fluent way, whether it's through spoken language or some other um, communication system or not. Are, are there people looking at the separation patterns in that? I love that idea. And to my knowledge, no. I think we should go there. Maybe we can talk. Yeah. And I think, you know, beyond right, some of those also the ideas of are there patterns early in life that predict good outcomes, right? Or that reflect um, different, you know, interventions they've had or exposures that are good that actually give them resiliency, right, against later sort of challenges too. I think that is a field, not in autism, but there has been a lot of work done on methylation patterns related to resiliency in other child outcome contexts. And so for sure, I think there's evidence to think about that in autism too. Are there sort of these resiliency or other good indicators? Yeah, that's really exciting. 
The other thing I was thinking about is how needing such large samples, you're always bumping up against the limits, right? And yep. I'm, I'm familiar with some of the things that are combining you know, across samples, mm -hmm. um, people who are trying to collect some common measures across studies. But most of what I'm familiar with is within the autism research world. Mm -hmm. Are there efforts to combine across studies where people are collecting in very labor intensive, mm -hmm. comprehensive data because they have a specific question in mind where then they could pool. So thinking about, you know, seed in autism mm -hmm. and what they've collected, I'll share that when one of my kids was enrolled in a study called Teddy, <laughs> because in the hospital where my kid was born, they were asking for borrowing a smidgen of that kill stick yeah. and looking for these genes that were um, related to type one diabetes. Mm -hmm. And my kid was in the study for 15 years, <laughs> giving 8 million specimens and samples wow. and parent report of a million things, mm -hmm. you know, done over yeah. over 15 years for, I think their target yeah. sample was something like 100,000 kids. Oh, wow. And along the way, they figured out that these, all of the kids in the study had five genes that increased your risk Mm -hmm. of type 1 diabetes um, to something like 3%, but it turned out 10% of the kids were developing um, another autoimmune disease. And mm -hmm. so they were they were kind of stretching and, and including that. But if all of the studies around the world that are collecting these intensive data sets for a particular kind of condition yeah. could pool and yeah. look at some, they won't be able to answer everything, but are, are people yeah. talking about sh sharing on, on that level? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, certainly for genetics and epigenetics, just main studies, we do that all the time. That is the idea of the consortia, right? They've all, there are challenges, right? Because they've all collected it in a slightly different way, but there are methods, right? And we are working on being able to harmonize those so you can combine them, right? So I think, yes, there are opportunities for that. There's also for, you know, I feel like this comes up a lot when we thought about gene environment interaction, yeah, or can we identify environmental factors, right, where the effect might differ based on underlying genetic context, what we found is, wow, there are these huge million person databases for genetics resources, right, across the world, but they don't have any environmental exposures measured right? And they have outcomes in genetics, but not the environment. Or you have a lot of studies sometimes that would have environment, right? And outcomes really carefully measured, but they lacked the sort of omics piece. And so that's where we started to think too about how can we use some of these biomarkers or patterns like the methylation to then be able to, let's say, go and use methylation or generate new methylation data in existing resources to be able to add new exposure measures, right? To be able to do some of this type of work. So I think there are opportunities there too, where how can we, um, you know, use methods to help sort of add data to existing resources that we couldn't maybe otherwise or not feasibly go back and recontact and collect all this data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have another one uh, back here. Can baby teeth or baby hair be used to detect methylation alterations? Should mm -hmm. parents be saving these bio samples? Ah, great question. <laughs> so you're asking the non-environmental um, person, but so um, hair, no, I don't believe so. It has to have, so in order to measure methylation, it has to have cell, a cell in it. I do not believe hair has a cell in it. I think it's just cartilage. Um, Kristen, do you know? I was like, well, Kristen's my environmental measure. I'm pretty sure. Um, baby teeth is actually an interesting one. There's been a lot of focus on baby teeth for measuring chemical exposures. Um, and so it turns out that part of the deciduous teeth actually do have a layer that has cells. So in theory, um, there may be an opportunity actually to you know, isolate the DNA and the cells from those teeth from that particular specific layer and measure methylation. Now it's a tiny number of cells, so we'd have to see if there is enough there to sort of work with our measurement technologies, but potentially for teeth, not for hair. Yeah. So another question is actually, if you wouldn't mind, could you please explain again about the blood test on the heel? Mm -hmm. What kind of testing is this used for in infants? Yeah, so it's used on all infants, right? So it's universal screening in the hospital. Before they leave, they have this testing done. The test on the blood is actually, it doesn't 
test for the gene variant. It tests for the phenylketylurea, right? Like that actual amino acid. And if it's elevated, that indicates they have one of these variants in the genes that's causing that to build up, which can be toxic. Mm -hmm. Diane, Chandel, did you have? Just a comment, actually, I wanted to follow up on the other diet. I just wanted to mention about the idea that, that Chris has discussed about mm -hmm. pooling of data across, across the globe from different studies to pool resources mm -hmm. in order to make sample sizes mm -hmm. large enough to make differences. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit speaking out of turn, and Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the flaws, even with the strategy, is that the, that the majority, most instances of individuals, it's not a diverse group. So mm -hmm. again, you're running across, yeah. you're getting a sample, large numbers of, of a very limited mm -hmm. pool of individuals across the human spectrum. Yeah. And so what I'm getting at is the diversity of participant enrollment in research. Mm -hmm. We need to encourage and provide a safe, safe, safe haven for individuals across with a, a diverse backgrounds to participate in research. Yeah. Because if you only have one genetic profile, you're not gonna find a difference. <laughs> we need the diversity right. there. And yeah. it's a really serious yeah. problem in Jeanette when you can speak yeah. to it much better. No, I 100% agree. agree. I think that's right. Uh, yeah. A lot of times they might, studies might take away, like they have 90% of one uh, group and mm -hmm. then 10% uh, of another, they still drop the 10% of the right. other because it's not enough people, right. not enough samples to do right. an analysis. So we're only getting very limited right. research results. Right. And, and it's it's increasing that diversity of the samples collected and the participation That's right. that will change that picture. Right. It's exactly, it's the diversity for detection, but also I would say for it to be applicable to those groups, right? If we're yeah, building right, it in right. one, right, right it's not gonna to translate to another and they're not gonna be able to benefit, right? In the same way. And so we really need that diversity. And I think the other one, you know, to, to your point on these big resources is, you know, I think one thing that's challenging is, you know, I feel like if they're big and they collect a lot, it's usually not detailed. And to date, it's mostly been a lot of these are just autism diagnosis, yes, no. That's not, I think, where we want to go as a field. I think we really want to go to where you're headed and, you know, what are some good outcomes? What are some of the more sort of specific challenges? And that data just doesn't exist in those. And so I think we need to do a better job of adding that level and that type of information to those to really move it forward. Yeah. And it's probably, sorry, I know I could go on and on this, probably, you know, it's probably not also kind of a one shoe fits all, like combining all and doing one big. I think it's probably going to take lots of different complementary work. Maybe you have some large scale studies that don't have a lot of depth in maybe phenotyping or, um, you know, measures of exposures, right, but could provide you a look and may find some things that are important, but you also combine that and complement it with these really carefully well done prospective studies with really rich data, right? It's probably going to take depth of small studies and richness combined with, you know, larger, but maybe not as deep information. Mm -hmm. oh, we've got one more question online. Uh, what causes chemical exposure? Oh, Chemical exposure could be uh, many. Again, this is outside of my usual box, but chemical exposures could be everything from, you know, I think when I talk about it, air pollution, right, in the air, air quality that contains certain types of chemicals and molecules and products to arsenic, right, in um, sort of ground and my understanding of sort of rice contamination that gets into foods, right, or, um, um PFAS in, you know, many of the different types of products we use in the home, many other kinds of chemicals exposures just come from the materials that we live and breathe in every day. <laughs> Hi, I have a question for you. Um, looking forward as we find like really useful mm -hmm. applications for these tools, how do we ensure equitable access? You know, I think genetic tests are becoming less expensive. I don't know about mm -hmm. methylation tests. Mm -hmm. And how do we, are we thinking forward to how are we going to make sure that everyone has access to these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's hard. I mean, I think it's a, a two-part question. I think some of them and the expensive ones are probably more for discovery, right? And sort of learning about what, how, what we need to intervene upon and how, right, to have those outcomes. And then that in turn will tell us 
how we can deliver it in sort of a cost-effective way. We might not need to measure the whole genome, right? Maybe we need to measure 26 sites, which costs us $5 a person instead of 250, right? So I think it's gonna be a little bit of, you know, sort of some tools are used for discovery. Others, once we know what we're looking for and how we can use it, we would tailor in a way that um, is efficient and effective. Questions. We've got everyone um, Great. Live. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. And if you have questions, I'm going to be here for a while. So I'm happy to talk to you sort of off the podium, too. And you can email me.